Welcome to the Fresh RN Podcast. In this podcast, we will be discussing various nursing scenarios, personal experiences, policies, and procedures. The information contained in this podcast is meant to supplement your existing knowledge and not replace it. Always refer to your state board of nursing and respective facilities, policies, procedures, and protocols to guide your practice. Thanks, nurses. Stay fresh. <laughs> I, I apologize. Start compressions. Oh my God, what do I do? Just picture that Muppet. Get on the chest. Blurg experience. All right, guys, welcome to episode three, what to do during a code. So we're going to chat a little bit about our first code experiences. Yep. You'll never forget them. Yeah. So, oh, by the way, I'm Katie Cleaver. <laughs> and um, my name's Elizabeth Mills. Yes. And we're going to talk a little bit about code stuff. And I really, I've worked in critical care, but then also Elizabeth has great experience in rapid response. But we wanted to start this episode talking about our first codes. Um, and I had mine, actually, I was off of orientation, but I was still a new grad. Yeah. Um, but it was on night shift. I had a um, patient, actually it wasn't my patient, but I was sitting up at the nurse's station and I saw the heart rate go from like 50 to, to 40s, which, you know, not terrible, but then it went to the 30s and I saw mm -hmm. the number 28 and I was like, OMG. So I went in the room. Something's happening. Something's happening. It's nighttime. And, and it of is, course, it's of nighttime. Course. It's dark. There's two patients in the room. <laughs> You're alone. It's, they're semi-private rooms. So I go into the room and I'm go she's the far one. And I go over there and it's like, ma'am, ma'am, hello. And I'm like, why didn't I immediately like finger to the jugular? I don't know. But You're checking responses. I was kind of, yeah, that was my thought. But I still was like, I don't know what to do. And then another nurse ran in behind me and was like, start compressions she's not breathing and I was like why didn't I notice that I've been in here for 20 seconds like why didn't I notice that um and so then I'm like frantically searching for the CPR lever um and then I couldn't find it <laughs> and then I someone else kind of swooped in um to start compressions and then I so I tried to situate her airway a little bit and the girl that started compressions in my mind I'm like okay, she's not low enough, she's not pushing hard enough or fast enough, but I'm not sure. I've never seen this before. Right. Like, I think that's how it's supposed to go, but I don't want to, like, and the other, there was a couple experienced nurses in the room, and they didn't correct her. So I was like, this must be right. So I don't know. And, you know, the patient, I think she went into, like, V-fib. Um, she was a post, like, cardiac surgery patient, ended up going into V-fib. We did a bunch of you know, um, the code team arrived and basically we all stepped back and they kind of did their thing. And I just kind of watched and it was just very like frustrating at the beginning to like, look at, like she ended up passing, but wow. looking at it from a perspective of, I didn't know what I was doing. Like I had no, I was so mad that I didn't start compressions in like the second I walked in the room. I didn't, I was mad I didn't correct the other person um, in the first, you know, whatever. And then, you know, shortly after she started, somebody else showed up and took over. And then I saw how an ED nurse does compressions. And, oh, my God, those are compressions. And then right. the, C the ICU CNAs actually came and did compressions, and they were amazing. But anyways, that was a really blurg experience. I think the lady, I'm pretty sure... Yeah, she would have passed either way. Um, she wasn't responding to any of our interventions. Um, and, yeah, so that was my first code. And, actually, I talk about it a little bit more specifically in my book, Becoming Nursey, um, which you can – if you go to freshrn.com slash books, there's a link to it right there. But um, what about your first code? Um, I also was a brand-new nurse. I think I had only been out of uh, – I've only been a nurse for, like, six months. And my first unit was – like a 24-hour OBS unit. Most of my patients were walkie-talkies. It was really easy. So at night, on the weekends, it was me and a nursing assistant because our, our census so was usually only – we had like less than 10 patients. And generally, these patients are super stable, like I said, walkie-talkies. Well, I had gotten this lady admitted in the middle of the night who had gone in – she was uh, from a nursing a skilled nursing facility, nursing home. She had come in with like an infected finger – and at literally an infected finger. And they did like an IND to wait, her wait, finger. What's, tell and, them what uh, IND is. Um, incision and debridement. She got some IV antibiotics. And because she was from a nursing home, they didn't just take her back to the nursing home. So they brought her up to my floor. 
she'd only been up on the unit maybe two hours and I'm walking by her room and she's laying flat and I just see blood spewing out of her mouth. <gasps> and oh once it, it's like, oh my God, what do I do? Yeah. What I don't do even I know do? the first thing I ran to do. in the room. Um, I did not have suction in the room. Oh. And I yelled for my nursing assistant who was a very skilled, qualified nursing assistant who, God bless her, thank God she was there. Um, and the, the first thing I'm freaking out is I'm, I'm like, what, what do I do? She had a pulse, but she, she didn't, she was losing her airway. She was turning blue and she had blood coming out. So I hit the code button. Um, and I'm just going to be really frank and honest. I ran out of the room and I ran to the supply closet to look for suction. So I left her. But Um, you needed suction. I needed suction, but I'm freaking out. Um, And the code team arrives. And when the code team arrives, they get there. Because the um, cardiac, one of the cardiac step-down units was just down the hall. So those nurses came. Um, I wasn't in the room. And I'm going to talk more about that later. Okay. But – Anyway, she she got intubated. She went to the ICU, and she did survive. You know, we didn't lose a pulse. We didn't have to do compressions or anything like that, but she needed an airway. Um, and so that is also considered a code blue. Don't – don't. Yes. Um, she, she wasn't breathing. A respiratory arrest, a cardiac arrest are both considered code blue. So. Yeah, let's go into some definitions. So let's define a rapid, maybe let's let, maybe define a code team or a rapid response team and then what technically constitutes a code. Because I think people struggle with alerting the troops and setting off the code alarm when they're, they don't want to do that if it's not really a code. That was my scary thing in, as a new nurse. <laughs> um, so rapid response teams are um, this this it's it's a safety goal initiative. It's regulated by the powers that be. Um, hospitals um, n- there's research that show that patients who end up having some kind of code blue event show decline up to eight hours outside of a code blue event. Um, most of code blues are somehow respiratory related, the majority of them. So patients usually start showing some kinds of respiratory issues eight hours out of an event. Not all of them. I'm not saying all of them. But most code blues are due to some kind of, of some uh, usually a respiratory issue. Um, so Joint Commission, um, things like that, have, have suggested or wanting or, or wanting hospitals to have, and most hospitals should have, do have, um, these rapid response teams. And what they're um, – they're also usually part of the code team, but um, their goal is to help nurses recognize these situations beforehand – get the patients what kind of interventions, move them to a higher level care, get the patients what they need so that that code blue event does not occur. And like an example of that is let's say you have a patient that is um, on a on a heart monitor and they're throwing a lot of PVCs, mm-hmm. preventricular contractions, and they're just increasing in frequency. Well, if you don't address that, they're probably going to have some other... They could. They could. There's something going on. Something's going on that needs to be addressed, and addressing that early prevents a code, essentially, or can prevent a code. So those are some of those early warning signs, Um, but anyways. And usually rapid response, a rapid response team consists of a registered nurse from a critical care area and then a respiratory therapist. Some teams and some big hospital facilities have like a nurse practitioner or PA who help respond. Um, you can have more people, you can have less people, but typically it's a nurse from critical care and a respiratory therapist. Um, and they, they're they to help, they are there to get things moving along and to help the nurses kind of figure out what's going on. Um, and so um, there's, there's lots of things that can, that can be imminent signs that something's not going right with your patient. Um, and this is, I'm stressing this particularly to nurses on the floor. Um, there's, there's lots, there can be changes in vital signs. Um, typically things like, um, if you see their heart rates that are heart rate going up, usually if they're sustaining a heart rate greater than 120 without any explanation, they're not in pain. They haven't been getting up, moving around. Um, 
if their blood pressures are starting to drop without explanation, um, you're go ahead. And well, and two, these aren't like huge, necessarily huge drops or increases. Like you have to notice trends. Like, right. if, you know, depending upon the settings of your alarm, if you're not checking their heart rate, like just peeking at it, like, you know, maybe the 120 or maybe they started out the shift with a heart rate of 70 and then they're asleep and their heart rate's 110. Like that's not going to alarm on your cardiac monitor, but it is up to you to notice that kind of stuff. Yeah. And and even if your patient's not on a monitor, but they're getting their vitals checked every eight hours and mm-hmm. you noticed, oh, you know, my blood pressure at, you know, um, eight o'clock last night was 150 over 70. They haven't gotten anything they're, you know, on all of a sudden your pressure is 80 over 40. Eh. That's a big, yeah. Yeah, that's something that you need to evaluate. Um, one of the, th- uh, another thing is if they're having increased oxygen requirements, mm-hmm. um, let's say they started out on room air, they've been feeling short of breath, their oxygen sats have been kind of low, all of a sudden they're on two liters, four liters. Now you're having to move up to a, a mask to keep their sats up and they're they're having more problems breathing. They're working harder to breathe. That is a big telltale sign something is not right. And that would necessitate, I believe, a rapid response call. Um, is, is the rapid... Now, uh, for those of you that don't know, Elizabeth actually worked rapid response for quite a while and she has extensive experience in various areas of critical care. Um, you know, a rapid response call, you know, that's something where it's like, hey, the patient's not actually coding. Yeah, okay. Like they're not in a respiratory arrest or a cardiac arrest, but man. Something's not right. Something's not right. And I need another set of eyes on here. And yeah. I can't just page a doctor and wait 10 minutes and 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 kind of talk it through them on the, with them on the phone. I need somebody's eyes with me here looking yeah. at this patient with me. Um, and, and so we can kind of figure this out, I guess. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't mention that before, but that's the goal of the rapid response team is to, to help you figure out what's going on. And decide what this patient needs. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing, other things to be, kind of be concerned is if patients having changes in mental status, you know, level of consciousness, if they were awake two hours ago and now they're knocked out and you can't wake them up or they're getting more confused or agitated. I mean, there's there's so many things, but um, what, I think that's one thing that doesn't get... The level of consciousness. Yeah. You know, and I think as uh, me and Elizabeth has, with a neuro experience, like... If you can't wake a patient up, that's a big deal. And when I say you can't wake a patient up, I mean you've turned on all the light, the bright lights, you've pulled down the covers, you are using, you know, sternal pressure or a trap pinch or something, and they're still not waking up. They're still breathing and they have a pulse. But if they're that obtunded, like there is a problem. Yeah. It's not like they're tired. No, if I'm pinching you and eliciting pain and I'm not getting a response, there is a problem. And um I'm not going to go too into detail of sepsis, but um, sepsis is a big thing that you big see a one. lot on the floors that um, sepsis is our body's response, an overwhelming response to infection. Um, it's a reason, it's a majority of the reason why patients end up in the ICUs. But um, there is criteria deal. that that diagnose sepsis, but before sepsis occurs, there's this um, thing called SIRS, S-I-R-S, which is, um, a, a, a group of criteria that if patients meet SIRS criteria, they should be looked at to see if they're getting septic. Um, yeah. and mental status is actually, I think, getting ready to be one of those SIRS really? criteria. Yeah. Wow. And I, I mean, I, this is probably a little, this is all overwhelming information maybe, but, um, but mental status is a big deal, um, and and I don't think sometimes that's necessarily looked at. Um, like you know, you've you you're come you've come on to a day shift, you've started your shift, and the nurse you know told you, oh well, they slept all night. Um, they slept well. <laughs> you walk in and your patient's okay. not responsive. Yeah. Um, rapid response call. That would. But anyway, so yeah, and the SIRS criteria are very like. Um, you know, a white count of blank, a yeah. a heart rate of blank, yeah. a, and you know, and it's very black and white. A respiratory but, rate of blank, a temperature of blank. And you know, as a, as a new grad and a new nurse, they there are all these very things that alone could be no big deal, and like, oh, just give them a little Tylenol. Oh, they probably were getting up and moving around, and that's why their heart rate was up. Things that could be easily explained away, I think. But if you look at them and put the picture pieces together, it's like, wait, yeah, this could be an issue. And then sometimes too, you even have to advocate to the physician that doesn't necessarily think it's a big deal, but it 
it, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, um, I felt, I always, I felt like as a rapid response nurse, the majority of things that we responded to were, um, respiratory distress was number one. Um, but number two was, was early signs of, of sepsis or some kind of shock. And then the next were like stroke, like issues mm-hmm. If, mm-hmm. Pa- if the nurses felt like, um, patients were having a stroke. Those were kind of the big three things. Um, so, you know, rapid responses or to, to a rapid response team is to be there to help you evaluate before that code blue occurs. But as a nurse, you're going to experience at some point a code blue situation. Um, if you've never experienced a code blue nurse or code blue in all of your career, um, God bless wow. you. <laughs> um, but if you're working in a hospital or, um, you, 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 you're going to, you're going to come across a situation like that at some point. Um, so what do you do? When, so what do you do? And, you know, you get BLS certified every two years, you go through the whole, you know, skills practice checklist on CPR and checking responsiveness and all this stuff. But, um, let me say, um, you're, you're gonna, um, it's, you're gonna have that moment. Like you're gonna have that. I don't know what to do scenario. I, I can't, unless you're, you're going through a code blue situation on almost every, and every time you work basis. Um, the more you see code blues, the more you go, you deal with them, the better you'll be. But if you're working on a floor and, and you, you don't see code blues often, you're gonna, um, you're gonna have that, <gasps> What do I do? And you know, it's funny, right before we started recording, me and Elizabeth were talking about how us as experienced nurses have even had that, oh my God, what do I do? Like I had still like you you freeze for a second, but then, you know, you'll get back to figuring out, okay, yes, I need to do this. I need to do blank. And we'll talk about those I need to do's, but it's important to know like, hey, you're not this terrible, awful nurse with no instinct if you have a little freeze moment. Like it's okay. Just get back on that horse and just go do whatever you need to do. Um, but let's say you walk into it. Maybe it's your patient. Maybe it's not. And a patient truly is coding. Um, there is, there, there are a few simple things that you can do that will make a huge difference. And the number one, absolute number one thing that you can do on someone who is coding, and we're going to just say for all purposes right now that they're having a cardiac arrest Yeah, is compressions. Yep. Um, so you walk into a room, you check a pulse. Don't wait around forever to try to feel a pulse. If you don't feel a pulse, get on the chest and start doing compressions. If that patient does have a pulse or that patient's going to have some kind of responsiveness and really isn't in a cardiac arrest, they're going to You're going to wake them up. (laughs) You're going to wake them up, right. And I've seen it happen where it's like, oh, wait a minute, they're they're grabbing. So literally their heart's not stopped stopped, or they're not, you know, in uh, pulseless electrical PEA, pulseless electri- electrical activity. But anyway, get on that chest. It's not wrong. Get on it. And, and that's where um, I know American Heart Association now is is almost just saying, you know, if you're out, you know, if you're if, if you're out in public somewhere and you see someone go down starting compressions and just doing compressions, and that's where we're stressing compressions because yeah. that's where patients are going to get perfusion. Because if you think about it, when you're doing compressions, you are literally pumping their heart for them. So if you, so because the blood is not being circulated in their body, so you are manually doing that for them. And the less, every time you don't do that, that's another, you know, however many seconds of their brain, their kidneys, their whatever, not getting any blood. Yep. So you cannot go wrong, I think, with that unless, I mean, you could, I guess, go wrong with that, but it's important to assess if you've got a pulse. Because if you have a pulse, you don't need to do one. Do compressions, but assess the pulse and then don't worry about, okay, now i got to give two rescue breaths or I've got to get the airway. No, just hop and the do the chest. And, the, and when, this ha- when this goes down in the hospital, like things happen quick. Like you see something going on on the monitor, um, you go in the room, you check the pulse, it's not going, boom, immediately you do compressions and then someone else is going to come in the room and they're going to worry about the airway. Right, right. Um, because there's no point in, um, you know – doing rescue breaths or breathing first because the blood's not going anywhere. Who cares right. if it's oxygenated? It's not right. going anywhere. Like we got to get it going places first. So that that's why the compressions are so vital and they're so important. Even after, let's say you get it going and you're doing them and they're tiring and exhausting if you're doing them correctly. And honestly, if you, the way, one of the ways, you know, you're doing them correctly. And I don't know if you've 
you know, felt ribs crack under your hands, but I sure have because yeah. it, to appropriately push the um, heart and compress it enough, you you really break ribs. So that's kind of one of the things that you know, ways that you can know that you're kind of doing it right. So yeah, I mean, get in there, you notice that patient, something's wrong, something's going on. Um, you've, you've activated the emergency response, whether that's yelling, push the code button, you get on the chest. Um, so, um, I just picture that Muppet in the, you know, like, Oh, (laughs) (laughs) when it with his little doctor coat on, what's his name? Not Kermit. Oh, I know. Baker. Beaker. Oh, oh my God. Beaker. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, get on the chest and, and <laughs> just, just, I don't know, have that in your mind. I need to get on the chest. I need to get on the chest. Even when people show up and you start charging the, um, defibrillator, you're still doing compressions. Yeah. So let's say you're, you know, someone has started CPR and you're helping out, you know, there's, there's process getting the crash cart, um, you know, respiratory response. And honestly, typically I let respiratory manage like bagging the patient. Yeah. Um, um, but just a couple of things. Um, and I'm going to go back. I always think about this with my first code blue. Your rooms should always have suction set up and ready to go. And an, and, um, ambu and, bag. An, and an ambu bag. That should be standard in every room. Um, because when you need it, you don't have time to set it up. It's right. kind of like thinking, oh, I'll get it if I need it. That's kind of like driving around in a car without a seatbelt thinking, oh, if I get in an accident, I'll put it on real quick. Like same thing. Like if you need suction, you need it that second. Right. You do not have time to set it up. Right. And, um, you know, you, you, you may come across a code blue event where your patient literally is, they're still breathing their, their agonal breaths or whatever, and they're going to need rescue breaths till the code team arrives and all that stuff. Um, but you need to have stuff like that ready to go in the room. Um, I don't want to get off subject, but so, um, what, what's your job as, as if, so this is your patient who has coded and, and what is your role? Um, now the code team has arrived. There's patients, people, not patients, people who have taken over to help do chest compressions, relief CPR, um, things like that. What, what are you, what are you supposed to do while you're there? One. You're going to stay with that patient. Don't leave the room because the code team has arrived. And we're saying this because we've seen it happen. Right. Um, <laughs> nurses you would have think gone to go would... check on their other patients. You would think you'd stay with your patient that's coding, but and not everybody me, does. You're going to get an overwhelming number of people there. Um, there's people that necessarily don't need to be there. You need to be there because the doc, um, who, who the team's going to say, well, what happened? What, what's, what's going on? You need to be able to provide that information. Um, and that's really why, why you're there. You're also going to help, you know, direct the code team. Where's my IV access? Um, you know, what kind of, you know, what's, you know, what, if they're getting fluids, what's going on. So you're there to help provide information. Um, other people should be contacting the family or talking to the family or, um, other people should be doing other things maybe, you know, but you're, you're there to kind of provide information, um, so, um, I, I just, you know, y- your job is to stay there. Also, um, if the patient survives the code blue event, our, our code blue train arrived. Did you know? <laughs> I know I hear that. <laughs> um, you're going to be helping transport that patient to whatever intensive care they're going to be going to. Yes. <laughs> I'm and very then, passionate about that. <laughs> um, and, and then you're going to be the one handing off report. Um, hold on, this is a very this is a loud train. The, the code blues are serious. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it is. Um, anyway, um, as I laugh, I digress. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so that's really you're there to to report off. And then um, another thing that I like to do is. Um, okay, so the patients moved to the ICU. The you know the ICU team team is helping them get settled. Um, I look to make sure that next of kin have been notified. Because, yes, don't let that step yeah, get that needs lost to in happen translation. If there's no next of kin there, um, um, but it's it's really a code blue is it's you know it's 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 going to happen. You're you're going to freak out. 
you know, if you don't freak out, something's wrong with you. Well, let me just say, if you don't freak out and you don't see them a lot, and then something is wrong. But it's, it's, it's a big deal. And, um, you know, I just want to stress, you know, getting on the chest. Mm -hmm. You know, if if you question whether, if you have any question about a pulse, getting on the chest. Um, and then you can get into other things like if they're V-fib arrest, early defibrillation and all that, that's what saves lives. The code team's going to help that. The people who are coming, responding, are going to help get the patient on the defibrillator, on the, you know, things like that. They're going to help you get that set up. Um, a couple of pointers I think that, that are good to do on floors is to have mock code events um, every, you know, month or so where... You actually run through a scenario. If you can get a, a CPR dummy from the education department um, of your hospital, getting a CPR dummy and running through a mock code and, and practice running down the hall to grab the crash cart, pulling the crash cart. Because let me tell you, those crash carts are usually locked, and sometimes those things are hard to drive. Oh, my God. I Yes. I These was are just running little to tidbits, a code little once. problems. Yeah. Running to a code once with, like, pushing the code cart, and I'm running around. I get there. I got it. And then the... The defibrillator pads fell off in yeah. transit, and it's like, where are my pads? This right. is the very first thing These I need. These are real things that happen. Yes. Yeah. So having those little mock code situations are very, very helpful. And if your unit doesn't do something like that, maybe you can try to start up a little committee or something yeah. to help to help go through, you know, to help to help run through those scenarios. Another thing is um, after a Code Blue event has happened um, and, you know, the dust has settled, um, something that I think is very important is to have a post-code huddle. Mm -hmm. And that should hopefully consist of, um, obviously, the, the nurse who was caring for the patient, the team that, not necessarily the whole team that responded, um, but I know as a rapid response nurse, if we had a code blue, um, I tried to make a point of going back to um, the unit and kind of going over what happened. Um, obviously, thanking everybody for mm -hmm. for the hard work that they did is so important, but also kind of going over what worked and what didn't. Um, and sometimes if it's a really emotional hard code or it's lasted a long time and there was a lot of stuff going on, having a chaplain there, because your 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 nerves are, are a little fried after something like that. That um, adrenaline it, is no joke, it guys. It is, right. And you're, you get a crash. Yeah, and you have... Um, you know, sometimes it's very upsetting and sometimes you need that emotional support. So um, I think it's really important to have have that um, available or, or to do that um, after a Code Blue event because you need encouragement. You need to know that, you know, you did a good job um, and, and need to know um, kind of some things that need to be worked on. Um, you know, maybe there's a process, a process, sorry, process improvement that needs to take place um, to have things run more efficiently. Um, in the in the perfect code blue ideal world, you know, you've got just set enough people in the room. You have set enough people to do compressions. You have the appropriate person pushing drugs. You have the ap appropriate person at the at the crash cart. You've got the lead whoever the code blue leader is. Sometimes that's a doctor, sometimes that's a nurse. You know, you got someone keeping up with time, you got someone charting. Everything is ideal and it's a very calm, collected situation. Um, I have really not, I mean, seen, seen a, whole lot of that. a whole lot of that. But well, it's hard to kind of to be calm and cool and collected if you're not used to those situations and your patient's literally dying at the in your hands kind of thing. So it's important to really, when and if those things happen, to... Um, re like debrief and and get the most out of every situation so that you can be better each time. Right. Um, it's so, so, so important. And if you're in orientation um, and you've got a really good established rapid response team at your hospital, follow them around for a day. Um, I know at some of the places that I've worked, um, we ha the rapid response team is a nurse who is not in staffing. Um, and they're kind of floating around the, the floors and going in and follow them around for a shift and see what they deal with. And that will help you um, maybe help prepare you. Um, no, you know, I feel like 
I feel like sometimes in code blue situations, um, you'll get like a lot of people who want to look on lookers and be like, mm-hmm. Oh, what's going on? I, wanna... I mean, no, there doesn't necessarily need to be all of that, but, um, you know, I encourage you to have a shift where you are going around with rapid response, um, to, to kind of see what goes on. Um, you gotta get because used to that. we want you to be somewhat, we want you to have somewhat a mental preparedness for what's going to happen, but hopefully you'll be the, a nurse who can recognize, um, situations before they happen. That's not always going to be the case. Um, yeah, even if you do everything perfectly, that, yep. that may yep. happen yep. and, and being kind of mentally ready to like snap into go mode and just go, you know, um, is right. really important. Right. Um, so yeah, hopefully this will get, has given you some, a little bit of insight, um, into rapid response teams, code blues, um, you know, also just, you know, every, I think every year you have like skills fair and stuff like that at your hospital. Um, but don't, don't take, you know, code blue stuff, um, like your checkoff slightly, be serious about it. Um, because when you come across that situation, you, you want to have at least some sort of uh, feel a little prepared. I don't know if that's just a pipe dream. But <laughs> but uh, takeaway points, guys. If you're, you know, pay attention to signs of declining status early. Mm-hmm. Involve the rapid response team. Don't don't worry about being, like, um, bothersome to them. If you think your patient needs them, the, the rapid response team would much rather be notified yep. and not being an issue right. than respond to a code in two hours right. that could have been prevented. Right. So keep that in mind. Um, if your patient is coding and you go in the room, the biggest thing is to make sure you or someone else is doing compressions. Someone else, if that is being taken care of someone BLS else's, has been started. Yeah, make sure BLS has been started, and you're you're uh, someone someone's doing compression. Someone's at the airway, and someone's making sure we got IV access. And hopefully, typically by the time you're kind of getting that situated, the code team will have be will arrive and slowly start taking those roles over. And but I, the compressions is the biggest deal. And you know, it seems like forever when you're in that scenario, oh, I'm like yes. oh my gosh, <laughs> the, where are they? And the code team gets there within you know. Really, a minute, really. Oh, most of real people. fast. Because people from other floors will come. I know I always have in my mindset, you know, I work in a neuro ICU right now, but I always have in my mindset, we're not always necessarily part of the code team in that unit. But if, you know, there's a code blue and it's right around the corner and I can go do it. I'm gonna I'm gonna run over there and help out. I, th- I just got this visual picture because like I remember when I was on orientation, you had stepped off the unit for a second, and I was getting my lunch, and then I was eating my lunch, and I come in or someone comes in like, <sighs> <sighs> like what's Breathing wrong? Fast. She was like, well, there was a code out on the hall, and I just went and did a couple rounds of CPR for him. I was like, oh okay, like okay, tell the code team arrived because it was like the regular neuro floor and she was the neuro I see nurse but wasn't on rapid response but she just did compressions for them yeah until the code team arrived and you know like that's how you help people out so it's important to you know when you're doing when you go to a code or when you're at a code you know um paying attention to the roles and making sure that they're addressed appropriately the code team should hopefully facilitate that yes don't yes. stay in the room though and just talk. I hate when people are we're no. in the middle of a code and there's people having conversations. It's very frustrating. So don't do that. And then my other thing that I really want to encourage you to do is if you have called rapid response or you've called a code, remember, do not leave the room. If your patient is necessitating a rapid response call, it's not like, oh, rapid response shows up, so I can go do all the 50 other things I got to do. Like, no, oh, yeah. this, this is the priority, and, and they need you there, and they're not they're not there to just kind of come take over in right. the rapid response situation when the patient's not coding. Um, and then when the ICU people come, and if you have a code, again, they might be doing all the task stuff, but you need to be there just in case there's a question. Yeah. So I really want to make sure that you're doing those kinds of things and taking advantage of educational opportunities and checking out codes if you need to or going with rapid response um, to check things out and never, ever forget to um, do your postcode huddle. Yeah. Even if people don't want to do it, it's really important to do that because especially as a new nurse, you need to kind of get acclimated and used to that situation of yeah. being in that environment and so it's you don't want to let that situation go by without debriefing because right. it's so... It is important. so important. Yeah. Um, yeah. Stay with the patient, guys. 
when, especially if you do a real response call, I've actually had nurses just walk out and be like, oh, well, I called you. Go check out my patient. I'm like, no, come here. We need to talk about what's going on. <laughs> yeah, what is going on with this patient that needs a rapid response call? I don't care if your other patient I'm needs a call. i <laughs> so, so, yeah. Don't do that. Um, so, yeah. So, that is our episode on what to do during a code. Um, check out freshrn.com slash podcast for um, our notes and any other, you know, maybe some links or anything that I've found that might be helpful. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'll put a link Hopefully to this. I hope this was helpful. Yeah, I hope this um hope this was helpful. Really want to encourage you. It'll it won't get um what what's the saying? You know, it won't get easier to see people dying or doing this, but it will get you'll get better at it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Experience is essential. So again, check out freshrn.com slash podcast. Um, check out freshrn.com for some gear if you want to get some cool gear. And uh, stay fresh, guys. Damn, girl, better hit the floor. All the other fellas better run for the door. Stop, drop, and roll with me. I got the heat that'll make you scream.